Thank you for uh, attending again the presentation of uh, Donaplot, and this time, uh, this time in a workshop setting. So we titled our presentation uh, Deep Learning Enhanced GPU Fingerprinting Technique. Uh, I am Naif Meana from the University of Lille, so it's Naif. <laughs> and uh, I'm going to be presenting with my uh, co-author, Tomer Lawa, from uh, the Ben Gurion University. So before heading into the technical details, let's talk about uh, a possible use case. So we have this guy that is uh, browsing the internet, let's name him Jack. And uh, what Jack doesn't know is that there is an unethical advertiser uh, that's acting uh, behind the scenes. So Jack goes ahead and uh, simply goes with his uh, browsing habits. And uh, Jack likes sports, so he goes on a sport website. And since the advertiser is present on this website, he is going to know that uh, Jack likes sport. And Jack goes ahead and uh, goes on his favorite social media platform, maybe Facebook, maybe Reddit. So uh, the advertiser is also present on this website. So he's going to know about uh, both of these visits. So in conclusion, the unethical advertiser is going to, say, to, tell, to uh, tell to himself, sorry, that he's going to show some sports advertisement in, uh, in the social media that uh, Jack uses. So what we didn't say is that Jack is a pretty privacy aware guy. So Jack disabled his uh, cookies. He made sure to use a browser extension that randomizes his browser fingerprint so he cannot be identified in a stateless uh, setting. So he, he also took care of the stateful uh, part so by disabling his cookies and not logging uh, any sensitive website. And by sensitive website, we mean the sport website in this case. So this leads to some questions. So Jack doesn't know how he's uh, actually watching some advertisement uh, because he took the necessary steps in order to hide himself. So how, how did the advertiser manage to uh, track Jack? So what the unethical advertiser did is that they used innovative hardware fingerprinting. And this is what Drone Apart is about. It's about showing that there are techniques that uh, are not studied extensively in the state of the art today that can uh, differentiate, differentiate between devices with similar uh, software and hardware, uh, and hardware configuration. So this is invisible, mostly invisible by the user and even user that uh, takes steps to hide their identity on the internet are still uh, subject to this kind of tracking. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to let Tom continue with the technical presentation of uh, John Apart, and then I'm going to take back the lead and uh, present uh, more technical details. So Tom, you're on. Okay, I'll share my screen. Uh, yeah, so can you disable your, your screen sharing? Okay, great. Okay. Um, so we wanted to focus on the GPU uh, because we looked at different uh, hardware units uh, on uh, computers and we thought that the GPU could be a nice thing to focus on because more and more devices have GPUs in them and specifically strong GPUs. Um, so all devices have GPUs, but it's, it's getting more and more stronger because of the deep learning wave. Uh, which is inferencing over GPUs. Um, and here you can see an example of an Intel uh, integrated uh, GPU uh, for the Gen 9 uh, uh, machines. And you can see that it has a lot of GPUs, uh, 48, and it's more than CPU calls. But there's a catch, each execution unit is uh, a lot weaker. But together, uh, you can do a parallel, parallel uh, tasks way faster because you have more calls, uh, for example, matrix multiplication. Um, and we looked on this architecture and we thought, like, what can we extract from it? What features can we use to fingerprint uh, GPUs, uh, even uh, G the same GPUs? Um, like the same model. And we thought that we need to focus on the parallel um, nature of the GPU because we think that this is where most of the features will be. 
Um, our hypothesis is that each GPU, even from the same model, show, shows differences on some scale. Um, note that each execution is, is very small. So if we have difference between them, uh, the difference can be quite large because the hardware itself is a, a small uh, individual. And in order to verify the hypothesis, we need to be able to experiment with different scripts interacting with the GPUs. Uh, we need to be able to prototype uh, our fingerprinting script. Uh, we need to try uh, a lot of things. Um, and we need to have the ability to do that in order to improve uh, our fingerprinting method. And we also need to run the same code on multiple machines with the same software and hardware. Um, so it means that uh, if we have uh, a fingerprinting script and we have 23 uh, identical machines, we can't go to each machine and like click on a button and run it. We have to do it um, uh, on the same time and uh, we need to automate it uh, in order to have um, correct uh, results between uh, all the uh, machines. And we, have, we need to have the multiple machines in the same environment, like same temperature, same pressure, um, because it might affect the results and we want to say that we're fingerprinting the hardware and not the temperature. Uh, this is our setup. Uh, this is a room in Ben Gurion University. Uh, it has a lot of computers in it. Uh, all the computers on the tables are uh, Intel uh, Gen 3 uh, machines. They are all identical, and all the machines on the floor are Intel Gen 4, and still, and uh, again, they are identical to each other. After this picture was taken, uh, we bought uh, Intel Gen 10 machines with NVIDIA GPUs, and they are sitting on top of Intel Gen 4 uh, computers. And we also have a lab with uh, Intel Gen 8 uh, computers. So we have a lot of uh, machines. And we, we really thank uh, the IT engineers at Ben Gurion University that helped us uh, with this setup. Um, and this is um, the way that we actually prototyped and gathered the data for the lab, uh, uh, for the lab uh, results in drone apart. Uh, we have our server that we want to have the data on and we have all of our identical machine, machines. Uh, so we actually um, coded the daemon uh, that will sit uh, on the machines and our server can interact with this daemon and uh, tell the daemon uh, the command that he will need to run the computer and the daemon will run this method, this command on the computer and um, execute the code uh, and the machines uh, will send the data back to the server. Um, in order to do that on the web, we need to use WebGL uh, to run code uh, in a web page. Uh, since this is the standard API in order to do GPU calculations in the web. And we have a problem about WebGL because WebGL doesn't have mutexes. Um, in order to fingerprint the concurrent behavior of a GPU, uh, what we really wanted to have is like a mutex that we can send, uh, that we can take, and we execute all the execution units in parallel, and we count um, which execution unit uh, had this mutex and when. Um, and this is what we did in the native experiments that we did, and it, results, uh, it resulted in a very good uh, accuracy, but we can't do that on the web now because we don't have new access. Uh, so we thought uh, on another idea, which is to use the rendering power of WebGL because WebGL is designed to render stuff. Um, so we took a number of vertices. Uh, we found that 10 is a good amount of vertices. And we actually time uh, the number that it takes to render um, a specific combination of execution units. Um, so we take all the, all the combinations that we can, like um, we, have, we actually have a bit mask of execution units. Um, some of them are ones, some of them are zeros. And the ones that are zeros actually get rendered uh, with a constant color. And the ones that are ones uh, are getting rendered with a, a color that is coming out of an intensive compute. So it will be stalled. We call that a stall function. And we count that time. Um, and uh, we classify these traces using random forest. We experimented a bit with different uh, machine learning approaches. And we found that uh, random forest is the most suitable classifier for uh, this data. And our results are pretty good. Uh, we can get up to 70% uh, on uh, Intel Gen 10 with NVIDIA GPUs. 
and even on a lot of devices, uh, 23 devices of intelligent force with a base rate, which is a random guess, which is what the state of the art would do. Uh, we get 4.3 base rate and around 64% accuracy, which is really impressive. Uh, and it means that the uh, drone apart can identify between computers in the same software and hardware in lab conditions. Um, and then we thought, like, can drone apart work on mobile phones? Um, but we, and the problem that we had is that we don't have all these phones lying around in the lab. In the lab. So we found a Samsung remote uh, test lab, and it's a very cool and unique website. What you can do there is you can get into the website and pick yourself a, a Samsung tablet or a phone, and you can request it for one hour or half an hour, and you can do whatever you want with it for this amount of time. And what we did with it is running drone apart, and it worked on mobile phones as well. Uh, which is really cool. Um, the next thing we did is we swapped the hard drives of two devices in the Intelligen 3 set. We did that to make sure that we are actually uh, fingerprinting the hardware. Uh, you can scan the QR code if you want to watch the video later. Um, and we were still able to identify the code device using one part. This is a very important experimentation because it's showing us that we are really fingerprinting what we want in the practical level. Um, now we have an hypothesis about, the web, about uh, WebGL, and it's that WebGL deterministically assigns execution units to vertices. Um, and we think that this is uh, the, the power of uh, the one apart. Uh, and next thing we did is that we integrated a uh, one apart in MAUnique. And MAUnique is a very cool website that lets you know how your uh, computer is different or similar to other computers on the web. I recommend that you go check that because it has a lot of cool features uh, that you didn't even know that uh, are used for tracking. And MAUnique has a Chrome extension uh, that follows uh, changes in your browser fingerprint over time. And we integrated one apart uh, uh, with MAUnique in order to gather data in a real world setting. Uh, in order to integrate it, we had to make sure that uh, users won't feel slowdowns because um, we don't want to hurt our users and we want our attack to be stealth. Um, and we did that by making sure that we are not running on the main context of the browser uh, by using the off screen method we are running on a um, side context. And we need to select the best all function for the in the wild settings. And we experimented with some stall functions and we found that computing CNH a lot of times uh, was the most consistent um, stall function across multiple sets of identical machines. And we had to ensure that it will support all the different configurations that can occur in the wild. Uh, we did some experimentation with GPU timer, uh, like uh, counting time in the GPU itself and not in the CPU uh, or JavaScript. Uh, and it worked well, uh, but we couldn't use it in the wild setting because a lot of machine doesn't support uh, the GPU timer. For example, uh, the Google Swift shader, which is really popular, doesn't support GPU timer. So we can't use that in the wild. Um, and this data set uh, contains around uh, 30,000 uh, 30, fingerprints collected from around 2,500 2, unique devices. And each collection includes seven traces. We had to settle down on a number that is a nice uh, uh, balance between the number of traces that we want and uh, how much we hurt our users in computation time. Um, using this data set, first we tried a uh, random forest on it, uh, but we had a problem because we have around 2,500 labels and it required a lot of RAM uh, and our server couldn't handle it. So we actually trimmed down the, the forest and it, it, it really hurt the expressive power of the classifier. Uh, so we tried to do something else. And the next thing that we did is that we tried to make clusters of devices using the canvas hash and render a string, uh, but the story wasn't compelling enough. And um, by that, I mean that uh, if we, like we took all the uh, machines with the same canvas hash and render a string, and we built a classifier for these canvas hash and render string labels. And inside of it, we classify the machines. But now we have a problem because if the canvas hash or render string of the computer is changed, um, it goes out of this cluster and we will, we will never be able to classify this machine again. 
Um, so we had to switch our uh, methodology and we looked at neural networks and neural networks have the expressive power that we need with a reasonable runtime and run usage. And what we did is that we took the um, trace, which is like tabular data, data, we took the times and we transformed it into a heat map, um, into a, like a square, a, like an image. And convolutional neural networks are really good at images. Uh, so we use them and we trained the CNN with semi-hard triplet loss in order to match map the original feature space into a lower dimensional Euclidean space. Uh, so we are actually tried to group the, uh, the embeddings of the same device together and uh, for it to be farther away than other embeddings of other devices. Um, when we um, selected the deep learning approach, we had to split our data set correctly uh, in order to evaluate ourselves. Uh, so we, we split our uh, collection into three major periods and we took the 65% of the labels in the first major period in order to train our neural network. And we used the other uh, labels uh, in order to evaluate uh, the, the network itself to see that it generalizes well to other machines. And then we used uh, uh, traces collected in later time in order to uh, evaluate uh, how much um, the network uh, is affected from uh, time changes because it wasn't trained on this time, it, it was trained on an earlier time. And we used the first major period to um, evaluate the improvement, the improvement of the state of the art uh, uh, solution. And we wanted to have the, um, the evaluation of the state of the art uh, completely separated from the evaluation of our neural network uh, because we didn't want to overfit the test data by mistake. So I'm going to uh, just add a few more details about the large scale uh, experiment. Uh, so since we switched to a deep learning approach, we had to uh, have a set of powerful machine because we couldn't run this on the set of machine that we had. We needed powerful machine with uh, a lot of uh, GPU power. So we found that we had a uh, grid 5000, which is a set of uh, different powerful server that are uh, split in different parts of uh, France. And uh, GUID 5000 is a big cluster that let us access machine with the powerful GPUs. So that's what we used in order to train uh, the drone about deep learning solution and in order to optimize the different parameters and try uh, various uh, neural network technique. So uh, continuing on this, we said we uh, tested different neural network architecture. So Thomas said that we, uh, uh, decided to ultimately uh, pick the convolutional and neural network. But before that, we tried uh, a few other methods. So the first thing that we tried were the vision transformers. So we found out that uh, it had a slightly uh, lower accuracy overall, and it was harder to optimize. So we just uh, dropped this uh, suggestion. So we also tried uh, training this convolutional neural network, but in a Siamese network setting. So it gave a similar accuracy and it was harder to optimize. So we just said that we're going to stay with a simple uh, CNN in order to uh, avoid the added computational cost. So we also tried uh, LSTM networks and this gave a very low uh, accuracy. So we just didn't continue with uh, this, uh, uh, this uh, architecture. And uh, finally, we tried uh, something that uh, is a bit different to uh, the other techniques. So what we did is that we tried to consider that a trace is a time series. So the idea behind this is that the deep AI model, which is an autoregressive model, is going to learn some, uh, some uh, is going to learn a little bit of the, uh, how, how the element of the traces are linked together. So how we did this is that we trained a model that is going to predict the last element of the uh, time series. And then the plan was to cut this last, uh, this last layer of the network and consider only the other layers in order to generate uh, an embedding. So this was a long shot, but uh, at the end, we found that uh, it had a very bad accuracy and we didn't continue on this. At the end, we just picked the convolution and neural network that worked best. So now I would like you to uh, put yourself in the mind of an attacker. So imagine you're an attacker and you have access from, uh, to a website. And this website uh, has a lot of users and a lot of uh, traffic every day. So the first thing that you want to do is gather a lot of data from a lot of users. 
Then once you have all this data, you're going to want to train an embedding CNN, the same one that Tom uh, presented. So when you have this embedding CNN, you're all set for uh, production. So in production, you're going to take each visit and you're going to uh, collect the uh, drone pod trace, which is going to be processed by the CNN. And once you have the processor trace, you're going to compute the distance uh, to all the, exist the existing traces uh, that you have in the database. And then it's going to give you an indication of uh, whose trace uh, this is. So Tomer is going to present the uh, results of uh, this experiment. And I'm wondering who is going to put you again in the mind of uh, an attacker. So Tomer, you can continue. Thank you. Um, and we evaluated uh, the, the mind of the attacker that uh, Naif uh, talked about uh, in the previous slide. And in, in this evaluation, we have, we have a lot of data in our hands uh, to memorize. And the results are good thanks to the amount of data. Uh, so we actually had, have around uh, 420,000 traces for memorizing. The top one base rate, which is a random guess, is around 1%. And the top one accuracy is around 28%. Of ten is around 67%, which is really impressive. Um, then we thought that it might not be the actual use case uh, for, um, for actual websites on the web, uh, because uh, on most, most websites, you can't really gather all this data beforehand. Um, so this is the improved mind of an attacker. Uh, so we got the same attacker, but he has a different websites with different users and we, he needs the drone apart fingerprinting method planning in production tomorrow. So he doesn't have a lot of time to actually gather all this data and train the embedding CNN again. Um, so what he can do is uh, one shot learning uh, because we already have an embedding CNN, he can use it uh, on his new website. Um, so in this evaluation, in the case of conditions, we have a small amount of data. And the results are really impressive, even though the task is much harder. So in the one-shot one uh, method, uh, we have around 14,000 traces for memorizing. The top one base rate is around 0%. Top one accuracy is around 5.5%. Top 10 accuracy is around 20%, which is really impressive. And if he has 10 visits um, from, uh, from the users, uh, he has around one, one, 100,000 uh, traces for memorizing. The base rate is the same. The top one accuracy is around 9% and top 10 accuracy is around 31%, which is really impressive. It means that drone apart can really work uh, in case of conditions, which is really what an attacker would like to have. So thank you, Tomer. I'm going to uh, share my screen again. Up. So I hope you can see my screen. So uh, now that Tomer showed that uh, drone apart was working uh, very well in, a, uh, in the real world scenario and also in the lab scenario, what we wanted to do in order to show that drone apart is really effective is to improve the state of the art. So we chose to go with the FP Stalker in order to, sh to show that drone apart is really effective. So FP Stalker uh, was published by Antoine Vastel and his co-authors at SNP uh, 2018. So at the time, it was shown that uh, browser fingerprinting was efficient for identification, but not for long-term tracking, because the fingerprint was uh, subject to some evolution over time, which made it uh, very difficult for an attacker to follow uh, whose fingerprint uh, it belonged to. So FP Stalker uh, showed a way that uh, browser fingerprinting could be used for long-term tracking. So before we head into our addition of uh, drone apart into FP Stalker, we, uh, we are going to see a little bit how FP Stalker works. So FP Stalker has two main steps. The first step is obviously the training step because FP Stalker works with a rule-based uh, step and a machine learning inference. So before everything, we need to have a trained, uh, a trained model. So, uh, FP Stalker also collected data from the Amarinic extension and used that in order to train the random forest. Once we had a trained model, we could go with the main algorithm. And the main algorithm said that for each incoming trace, it's going to apply a series of rules. So rules that uh, made sure that, uh, for example, two fingerprint uh, could be from the same instance. For, for example, that the browser could be only a superior version to the one that they had in the, in a data, in the database. This is just one example of the rules. So it goes to that step. And then uh, we have a set of 
possible candidates. And this set of possible candidates goes through the random forest model. The random forest model is then going to output a probability of two instances being uh, from the same uh, device or from a different device. So once we have that, uh, we pass this uh, probability through a threshold that FPStalker uh, that FP Stalker generated. So they have a side algorithm that pick the best threshold possible. And if the, probab the probability is above the threshold, we are going to link these two fingerprints. If not, then it's simply going to create a new linking chain. So these are the, uh, what you can see are the, um, uh, the attribute that were used in uh, FP Stalker. What we wanted to add is the, uh, the drawn apart processor trace. So in order to adapt FP Stalker, we had to uh, think about a few uh, different uh, uh, different conditions. Because between 2017 and today, the webs changed uh, consequently. So Flash became unsupported by uh, all major browsers since 2021. And you might think that it's okay because it wasn't used anymore. But FP Stalker actually made use of Flash-based attributes. So it, mean, it meant that it's unusable in the current state of the web. So what we had to do is adapt FP Stalker to the current web, but we, had, we also had to ensure that the results remained, remained on par with the paper. So the first thing that we had to do is understand the logic behind FP Stalker in inspecting the existing code. The second thing is that we had to identify what can be optimized uh, to run it uh, on our machines. And we identified uh, several bugs that could impact the accuracy on the way. So we fixed that. And we also optimize the code uh, logic and readability. So after that, we had to compare our adapted version of FP Stalker to its, to its original algorithm on the provided data set because it had a flash attribute. So we had to make, to, to make sure that we didn't drop the original accuracy of FP Stalker. So in order to introduce a uh, drawn apart into FP Stalker, we had to find the uh, ideal position in the algorithm. What you can see on the right is the algorithm taken from the uh, FP Stalker paper. And I put into a green block the machine learning site. So we tried many things before uh, picking this position where we could put uh, drawn apart. So the first thing that we did is that we tried inputting the drawn apart trace into the machine learning algorithm. So this didn't work well. We tried to remove the rule based step and uh, replace it with uh, the distance of uh, two traces. And this didn't work well uh, also. And we also tried simply inputting the distance between two traces into the machine learning uh, algorithm, the, the random forest. And it didn't work out. So we noticed uh, at the end that the machine learning step classified only a few percentage of the traces due to the, due to the generated threshold being too high. So this is where we wanted to add, to add drawn apart. So before adding drawn apart, we had to, uh, to use the, uh, the metrics that FP Stalker was using the, in their paper to quantify how much we improved the state of the art. So FP Stalker uses the average and maximum tracking time in order to quantify the performances. The average tracking time is the same as asking uh, for a given device, how long can we track uh, the fingerprint on average? So we use this metric in order to improve uh, FP Stalker. So what we did is that we integrated uh, drawn apart by short circuiting the machine learning step. So what we did is that we put drawn apart right before the, the machine learning algorithm. And we said that if uh, two traces, uh, the distance between two traces is below the threshold, then we conclude the search. So the threshold was picking by looking at this graph that we obtained. This is the histogram of the Euclidean distance between same devices and different devices. So we can see that if we pick a threshold of around 0 0.6, we're almost sure to avoid misclassifying as much uh, traces as possible. But we still leave room uh, to uh, FP Stalker in order to perform its regular classification. So this is more like not short circuiting, but uh, complementing FP Stalker with drawn apart. So another thing that we noticed, that we noticed is that FP Stalker was criticized for its algorithm being too slow. And with our addition, FP Stalker ran in, uh, so uh, the original FP Stalker ran in seven hours. And we, with our addition, it managed to run in four hours. So we also improved on that point. So what you can see finally is the improvement that we noticed on uh, FP Stalker. What you see is the average tracking duration. And in the paper, we say that we improved the average tracking duration of over 66%. 
And this means that we improved uh, the tracking duration, if I remember correctly, from 17 and a half days to 27 days uh, approximately. So this is a great improvement to the, the state of the art. So thank you for uh, listening to our presentation and uh, we're ready to discuss anything that you have in mind.